Good evening. Thank you for joining us. The first question that we're going to take up is why did Paul circumcise Timothy after the Acts 15 agreement? Why did Paul circumcise Timothy after the Acts 15 agreement? So let's start in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Acts 15, 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So Paul is in Antioch at the time. Some folks come down from Judea and they essentially say, well, look, if you're actually truly going to be saved, you have to be circumcised. Verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. So why was there no small dissension and disputation? Because obviously from Paul's point of view, circumcision was not required for salvation. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So we're going to come back to Acts 15, but get Galatians chapter 2. So just to be clear about what's going on here, Paul's in Antioch. Some come from Judea and say, except to be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. There's no small dissension and disputation, which means if it wasn't small, what was it? It was big. And so they decide, well, let's go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. They're, they're speaking there. The, the idea there is to go to the kingdom uh, uh, elders, the leaders of the kingdom church in Jerusalem. Galatians 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So you can see there who's going up to Jerusalem. Verse 2, and I went up by revelation. So how did Paul know to go up to Jerusalem? Revelation, God told him to do it. And communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So Paul shares with the leaders of the kingdom church the gospel that he preaches among the Gentiles. He did that privately, it says, to them which were of reputation. That's obviously the leaders of the kingdom church. Now notice verse 3. But neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. I love verse 3. Clearly what, what's going on is Paul has been told to go up to Jerusalem by revelation as to the question of whether Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to be saved. He goes up with Barnabas. Now if Paul and Barnabas go, both go up, you know what they both are? Jews and they're circumcised, right? So he says, I'm taking with me a test case, essentially. I'm taking Titus with me, who is a Greek, who is uncircumcised. Look with me then at verse 4. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Jesus Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. So Paul looks at the idea that Gentile believers today have to be circumcised as people that come in privily and spy out the liberty that you have in Christ to bring you into bondage. So let me just make this point before we go on. When people today want to add conditions to what you need to do to be saved, what are they doing? They're bringing you into bondage. They're, they're opposing the liberty that you have in Christ. Verse 5, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So Paul's very clear on his gospel, and he doesn't tolerate this for a moment. He says, look, no, I, we're going to have dissension and disputation about this. So... Again, read verse 3, but neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. 
So what is the outcome of the Acts 15 conference? Who wins? Paul wins because there is nothing added to his gospel. He takes Titus, the Greek, the uncircumcised Gentile with him. They go up to Jerusalem. They come back. Titus is uncircumcised. Obviously, Paul has prevailed. Now go back with me to Acts chapter 15, verse 23. Acts 15, verse 23. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. And we've, we've skipped over all the discussion that goes on in Acts 15, but you can read that later if you'd like. The apostles and elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. And so this is the leaders of the kingdom church writing to the Gentile believers. Verse 24, For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Now what's going on there is not only does Paul win, in this discussion that takes place in Acts 15, the leaders of the kingdom church send out letters saying Paul won, right? That's essentially what they do there. What, what they send out letters saying that it is not a requirement that Gentiles be circumcised and keep the law in order to be saved. So that's Acts 15 really briefly, really quickly. There's a dissension and disputation about whether Gentiles need to be circumcised to be saved. It is resolved. The answer is no, they do not. And when Paul comes back from Jerusalem, he has with him Titus, who remains uncircumcised. All that makes sense. All that fits together. Very clear. But now look at Acts 16, verse 1. Acts 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. So Titus's mom is a Jewish. She's a believer. His father was a Greek. Verse 2, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Verse 3, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Now pause just for a minute. Acts 15, the entire chapter is about, do Gentiles need to be circumcised to be saved? And the definitive answer to that is, no, they do not. Titus isn't circumcised. Paul returns back to Antioch with Titus in an uncircumcised condition, demonstrating that Gentiles do not need to be circumcised to be saved under Paul's gospel. The very next chapter, Acts 16, three verses in, what does Paul do? He takes Timotheus, who is going to travel with him, and he circumcises him. Why does he do that? Isn't the whole point of Acts 15 that you don't have to be circumcised to be saved today? Well, here's what I think is going on. Paul circumcises Timothy not because his gospel requires it. His gospel obviously does not require it. But Paul circumcises Timothy because Timothy is going to travel with him, and Timothy is part Jewish. Look with me at Galatians 5, verse 1. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now you notice verse 1 says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. When someone is lost, 
what do they operate under? They operate under the law. And you know that because Galatians 3 tells you that the law is a schoolmaster to do what? To bring us to Christ. What the Old Testament law does is this. If you read the Old Testament law, if you understand the requirements of the Old Testament law, what does it declare to you? It declares you to be a sinner because there's a bunch of rules and a bunch of rules and a bunch of rules, and how good are any of us at keeping them? And the answer to that is not so good. So what the Old Testament law does is it declares someone to be guilty, and it's a schoolmaster to bring people to Christ, because what it does is it says, look, you're under the Old Testament law, you are failing at keeping it, so you need help. And the only help that is available is Christ died on the cross for your sins. He paid the full penalty. If you have faith in the blood that He shed for you, then you'll be saved. So now Galatians 1 says this, 5, 1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ hath made us free. So you weren't free, you were made free, because you used to be under the Old Testament law, you used to be under the yoke of bondage, but if you're in Christ, you're no longer under it. Romans 6, 14, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And that's how we're supposed to function today. One more thing on this before we go on. The book of Galatians, the central reason it is written, is that what happens is Paul preaches in the region of Galatia, and then he leaves. And he says in Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. In other words, Paul leaves for a short period of time, and what happens to the Galatians? They're removed from Paul's gospel unto another gospel. What Galatians 3 says, and let's just look at it together. Look with me at Galatians 3. <clears throat> Galatians 3, verse... Two. This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And the answer to that is the hearing of faith. The, the way that you obtained the Holy Spirit, the way that you got saved, is it wasn't by keeping the works of the law, it's you heard the gospel and you responded in faith. Verse 3, are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians is all about the following temptation, the following danger, and that is this. What a believer can do is a believer can start with the hearing of faith and be saved. But then they can decide, well, to grow, to be perfected, I need to do so by the works of the flesh. I need to do so by keeping the Old Testament law. Galatians is written to refute that. You, don't, you, you began in the Spirit, and so what should you continue in? the Spirit, not the works of the flesh. <clears throat> Get with me 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. So what Paul says in Galatians 5, 1 about stand fast therefore in the liberty that you have in Christ, the idea is don't let someone else, don't let a, a religious authority Take, the fr take away the freedom that you have in Christ. Notice with me 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. Notice this, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. There's two principles going on here. 
The first principle is stand fast in the liberty. If someone wants to take away the liberty that you have in Christ, the answer to that is absolutely not. When people came to Antioch and said with regard to Paul's converts, if you're not circumcised, you're not really saved, what was Paul's response to that? Big dissension and disputation. They had a big fight. He was like, absolutely not. That's wrong. Let's go up to Jerusalem. We'll settle it. I'm taking Titus with me. He's not getting circumcised, and there's no question who's going to win. It's me, right? Because Paul fought on the issue of people trying to put conditions on his gospel. But what did Paul then immediately do after Acts 15? When he takes Timothy with him, he doesn't circumcise him because he's submitting to a religious authority that says, you have to be circumcised to be saved. He doesn't do it for that reason. He does it for the reason of 1 Corinthians 9. He has made all things to all men that by all means he might save some. In other words, how should you use your liberty today? Should you use your liberty for just indulgence and whatever your whims are? Or should you use your liberty so that you do whatever is possible to serve other people and save some? That's the idea. Th th think of it this way. Life really is, is, is quite simple when you get down to it. There's a lot of complexities and so on, but you're going to spend eternity in one of two places if you're alive today. You're either going to be in the new heavens or you're going to be in the lake of fire. Doesn't matter what your title is, doesn't matter what your job is, doesn't matter what your house is, doesn't matter what your income is, you're going to be in one of two places, right? So once you settle that issue, that you're going to be in the new heavens for all eternity, what becomes the next most important thing? The next most important thing is the fact that what are you surrounded by? You're surrounded by a bunch of other souls that unless something changes, they will be in the lake of fire. That is the reality. So the rest of our lives should be about, how do I grow in grace? How do I grow in knowledge of the Word? How do I do what I can to effectively preach the gospel to those around me? So why does Paul circumcise Timothy in Acts 16? He doesn't do it under religious compulsion. He doesn't do it because his gospel requires it. He does it because he is becoming all things to all men that by all means he might save some. That's what he's doing. Next question. What does James 2 mean when it says Abraham was justified by works? So let's go to James 2. James chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 21. James 2, 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Verse 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. Well, there are three verses in James 2 that specifically speak of justification by works. But compare that, so leave a marker in James 2, but get Genesis 15, verse 6. Genesis chapter 15 and we'll look at verse 6, Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So Abraham was counted righteous in Genesis 15, 6, and he was counted righteous because he believed. So that's not justification by works. Get Romans chapter 4, verse 2. Romans 4 and verse 2. Romans 4, 2. 
For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So in James 2, we saw three verses that said that Abraham or other people were justified by works. But then there's Genesis 15 and Romans 4 that speaks of justification by faith. Get with me Galatians 2.16. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. Now notice the last part of the verse. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So we've got kind of a contradiction here, kind of a problem, don't we? James 2 has verses that say that Abraham and others were justified by works, but then we have other verses that say, well, no, Abraham was justified by faith. And Galatians 2.16 goes so far as to say, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So how do we reconcile these? Let's turn to James chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 14. Now, the first thing to notice is this. James 2 is the chapter that differs from all the others. That, In other words, when we looked at Genesis 15, when we looked at Romans 4, when we looked at Galatians 2, those all indicated justification not by works, but by faith. So James 2 is the one that's different. So let's spend some time in James 2 to try to understand what's going on. James 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So James 2.17 indicates that the people that it's written to, if there is faith that is not accompanied by works, it's dead. In other words, faith that is alone, that doesn't have works, is dead. Now think about that just for a minute, because doesn't Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say the opposite of that? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words... James 2.17 and Ephesians 2.8.9 do not say the same thing. James 2 says, faith without works is dead. So are works required? They are. But in Ephesians 2, Paul says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. So continuing in James 2.18, let's keep reading. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith. And I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So in James 2.20, just like in James 2.17, we see that in the context of James, faith without works is dead. Works are required for faith to be actual faith. Now notice James 2.21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works 
when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar. So James 2.21 comes right out and says, well, Abraham was justified by works. And then it tells us when he was justified by works. When was he justified by works? Well, according to this, it's when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. So keep James 2, but get Genesis 22. Genesis 22, verse 12. And what we're doing here is we're turning to the part of Genesis where Abraham was preparing to offer Isaac. So Genesis chapter 22 and verse 12. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Verse 14, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So in James 2.21, when it says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? James 2.21 is referring to Genesis 22, because it's in Genesis 22 that Abraham is on Mount Moriah with Isaac, and he prepares to offer him. Now, go back with me to James 2, and we're going to look at verse 22. James 2, 22. And I'm going to read verse 21 again because I want you to see the flow of this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. That verse right there, I'm going to suggest to you, is the key to understand what's going on. Now, notice the last part of the verse. By works was faith made perfect. When we think of the word perfect, we sometimes think of flawless, without any error, incapable of being improved. So, in other words, if you got a 99 on a test, it's not perfect. It would be an A, but it's not perfect. If you got a 100, it would be perfect. That is one meaning of the word. But I want to read to you, uh, this is from the 1828. This is the first definition of perfect. Finished, complete. Then it goes on to say some other things. But the, the word that I want to notice is the word complete. The word perfect can be used in the sense of meaning complete. Why does that matter? Keep James 2 again, but get 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. I'm going to show you several verses here, and I want to prove the following point. And the point is this. No one ever at any time is saved by works. No one ever at any time is saved by works. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You see how it says, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace? Get Titus 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. So did God save us by works of righteousness? Of course not. It was, we're saved by His mercy. 
I'll just quote to you Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There are multiple verses that tell you that no one is ever saved by works. One more point on that. If someone, if anyone at any time was saved by works, they could say this to God. My works saved me. You didn't give me something. I earned it. Man would have the ability to boast. Isn't the whole purpose of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to avoid man boasting? Isn't God's design that people are saved by faith to exclude boasting? So as you think about the dispensational chart, there is no one ever at any time that is saved by works. It is an empty set, okay? Now, get Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith, it is really difficult to please him. Sorry, I was reading from a modern version. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So there is no one that is saved by works. What is the only way that anyone is ever saved? Faith, right? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, you're in Hebrews 11. Let's notice a couple verses together. Verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Verse 17, Hebrews 11, 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was offer, tried, offered up Isaac. That's what we looked at in Genesis 22. Hebrews 11, verse 20. Hebrews eleven twenty. 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. Hebrews eleven twelve, 12. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. So here's what I want you to notice about Hebrews 11. It says in verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. When you read through the chapter, there's a whole bunch of verses and they all begin with the same two words. What are those words? By faith. By faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please him. But when you read those verses, do the men mentioned in those verses always do the same works? And the answer is they don't. They do different things. And they do different things because God's revelation to them was different. So to take the most obvious example, what Hebrews 11 verse 7 says is by faith Noah, and what did Noah do? He prepared an ark. None of the other folks did that. Why did none of the other folks do that? Because the revelation to them was not a flood is coming and you need to prepare an ark. So what have we learned from Hebrews 11? Without faith, it is imp impossible to please God. When it lists all of those folks that please God, what they did in terms of their works were all different. But the commonality that they all had is they all operated on the basis of faith. Now, let me just say this. When God's revelation to you 
requires an act of obedience, doing the work is necessary as an expression of faith to make faith complete. Let me say it uh, maybe a simpler way. When God told Noah, Noah, there's going to be a flood. If Noah had said, God, I have faith that there's going to be a flood, but I don't feel led to build an ark. I don't feel moved to do that. What would have happened had Noah had that attitude? He would have drowned, right? Did preparing an ark save his physical life? Yes. Did preparing an ark save him spiritually? I don't believe so. Because what did we read in Genesis 15, 6 that God determined regarding Abraham? Abraham believed God, and what did God do? Counted unto him for righteousness. So what you're simply seeing in Hebrews 11 is this. When God's revelation at a given point in time says, do this thing, you have to do that thing to actually have faith. If your response is, God, I'm not going to do that thing, then what do you not have? You don't have faith because you don't believe the revelation that God gave you. So let me give you another for instance. Under the kingdom program, faith without works is dead because the content of the revelation required works as an expression of faith. What's the most obvious example? Mark 16, 16. So we're coming back to James, keep James 2, but go to Mark 16, 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So let me give you just a for instance. So if someone believes and they're baptized, they're saved, right? What happens if someone doesn't believe, but they get baptized? They're not saved, right? Because they don't believe. Let, let me give you, get with me Luke 7:29. Luke 7, 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God. How did they do that? Being baptized with the baptism of John. So when people heard the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and they believed the message, what did they do? They got water baptized. Verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. So let me give you a for instance here. Under the kingdom program, was it easy to tell whether or not someone was a believer? Well, they either submitted to John's baptism, and if they did that, that'd be a pretty good indication they were a believer. And if someone said, nope, what does that indicate according to Luke 7.30? It indicates they're not a believer. But understand this. Is the person that believes the gospel of the kingdom saved by their water baptism? No. And, and what's the best example of that? The thief on the cross right? The thief on the cross believes, Lord, remember thou me. And what does the Lord say to him? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, even though the thief on the cross was not baptized. Now, let me give you one more example. Let's say that someone is in the wilderness, 
They hear the preaching of John the Baptist and they say, well, I believe this. I believe the gospel of the kingdom. So I'm going to get in line to be water baptized. And so, you know, they take a number, they're waiting in line. And while they're in line, they have a heart attack and die. What happens to them? Does God look down from heaven and say, well, that's a, that's a shame. You are so close. Like you were number six. If you had just survived five more minutes, you would have been saved. It doesn't work that way. What happened was when that individual in their heart had faith, what did God do? He counted it for righteousness on the authority of Genesis 15, verse 6. When someone believes God, he counts it for righteousness. And the fact that he had the heart attack before getting to the front of the line does not cause him to not be saved. Okay? The, the external act is an expression of faith that you cannot affirmatively refuse. What Luke 7.30 says is the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. So in other words, if you have the opportunity under the gospel of the kingdom to believe and be water baptized and you say, nope, I don't want it, then that's a demonstration that you don't have faith. But if you have faith and believe, but for some reason you can't perform the act, like you're in the line and you die before you get to the front of the line, or you're the thief on the cross who would love to be able to get down from the cross and get water baptized, but it just isn't going to happen. Go back with me to James 2, verse 23. And I'm going to read 21, 22, 23 together so you get the flow. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? That's Genesis 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? See, the issue in verse 22 is not that the works save you. It's that the works make faith perfect perfect. They make faith complete. Now notice verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. What is James 2, 23 quoting when it says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness? It's quoting Genesis 15, verse six. I'll just read it to you. Genesis 15, 6, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So let me ask you this. When did God count Abraham righteous? And the answer plainly is Genesis 15, verse 6. Did God have to wait to Genesis 22 to consider Abraham righteous? The answer to that is no, he did not. God considered him righteous in Genesis 15. Now, if you notice what James 2.23 says, it says, and the scripture was fulfilled. I read you the definition of perfect earlier. I'm now going to read you the definition of fulfill. And this, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary. This is the second meaning. Fulfill to make complete to supply what is lacking in. So to fulfill is to make complete. If you recall what James 2.22 said was by works was faith made perfect. Abraham had faith in Genesis 15.6. God counted it for righteousness at that time. Genesis 22 was simply a work that made faith complete. Look, at me, look with me at James 2, 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead 
also. So let me sum up what I think is going on here in James chapter 2. Was Abraham justified on the basis of works in terms of declaring him righteous? Or let me phrase it this way. What does James 2 mean when it says Abraham was justified by works? What is it saying? And what it's saying is this. Based upon James 2.23, God counted Abraham righteous in Genesis 15 on the basis of faith. That's very clear. In Genesis 22, Abraham's preparing to sacrifice Isaac was a work that made his faith perfect, or it made his faith complete. That work didn't save Abraham, just like the thief on the cross was saved without being water baptized. Abraham was already saved in Genesis 15. What the work did in Genesis 22 is it demonstrated the faith that Abraham already had. Go back with me to James 2.18. And you'll see this. James chapter 2, 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Genesis 2, 22, Genesis 22, was a demonstration of Abraham's faith. Abraham's faith was, was shown by his works. By works was faith made perfect. It was made complete. It was a demonstration. It was a proof of the internal faith that already existed. But when did Abraham get declared righteous before God? It was in Genesis 15, verse 6. It was not in Genesis 22. So hopefully that helps you understand what's going on in in, in James 2. I'll say one more thing. So when you think about the book of James and you see things in the book of James that differ from Paul's writings, here is what's going on. As you think about the dispensational chart, as you think about the timeline of history, At nearly every point on that timeline, faith is demonstrated by doing a work. It's not that the work saves you, because no one is saved by works, but faith performs that work. Noah performed the work of building an ark, but Noah was saved by his faith, because it says, by faith in Hebrews 11. Abraham, similarly, was counted righteous by faith, but he performed works because the content that God gave to Abraham told him to do works. What is unique, what is extraordinary about the dispensation of grace is that the revelation given to us says You're justified without the expression of works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, once you're saved, should you do good works? Yes. But in the moment you're saved, you know what you're saved by? You're saved by faith alone, apart from any works. You can decide if this part is true or not. What causes me fear and trepidation is when you hear people respond to the question, if God were to say, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? And when they respond with a work, that is not the gospel during the dispensation of grace. Why should I let you into my heaven? Some folks will say, I've been water baptized. 
Well, that's not what Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says. I live by the golden rule. I keep the Old Testament law. I'm basically a good person. You know all the things that people say. When they are saying those things, they are contradicting Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says not of yourselves because they're giving you their resume. The way that things work during the dispensation of grace is when someone has faith in the gospel without any expression or reliance upon works, God justifies them in that moment. Praise God that he's made it so, so simple for us that, that Jesus Christ did it all, paid the full price for all men, and uh, it's our responsibility to believe. So hopefully that gives you clarity on James chapter 2. We'll go ahead and uh, conclude. Let me, let me close this in prayer. Lord, we, we rejoice in your goodness. We thank you for the truths of your word. Help us to understand them more clearly. Help us to teach them properly. We pray that you would be glorified in all things. Amen.